So hi everyone, my name is Lia. As Anna mentioned, I'm the engagement officer for the Lemon Foundation program. It's my pleasure to have you all here online and in person and to kick off our first discussion with Miguel Lago, Beatriz Kira, Andrew Pollard and Jacqueline Goes. Thank you everyone for being here and enjoy. Good afternoon to, to all of you uh, who are here in the room and also well, in Brazil. Um, uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation, Nairi, Anna, and the whole team. Um, and today we have three fascinating people that are representing three extraordinary teams from Oxford University uh, who really faced and, and whose work faced the, the, the biggest health crisis we had in our, in our generation. Um, and uh, so we have here Dr. Jacqueline Goish, uh, who is Brazilian. Uh, who um, basically uh, is part of the team that did the sequencing of the first genome of, of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus in Brazil. Uh, and also Jacqueline had a, a, a Barbie doll that was uh, inspired on her. Uh, and uh, for the fun fact, uh, Sir Andrew Pollard that is here with us uh, that well in 2020, uh, basically uh, was the chief investigator of clinical trials of the Oxford uh, AstraZeneca vaccine. And, and thanks to his work and his teamwork, now we have over 1 billion uh, doses of this vaccine across 170 countries saving lives. And we have here Beatrice Kira, that is also a researcher from the university and uh, who, um, uh, who's, uh, whose work and is part of the team, uh, that the amazing team that, uh, that, that is doing the COVID-19 government tracker, uh, the government response tracker from Oxford University, and um, especially the work of Beatriz uh, uh, in, in the Brazilian and analyzing the Brazilian data, uh, it was the first country that you, you, you managed to get the subnational data, which is of huge importance to understand uh, the capacity of response that Brazil had. Um, uh, so uh, normally we have this shared perception in society that researchers are, um, uh, are, are in their ivory tower uh, they, are, they are alienated or isolated from the real problems, from the real world. And one of the things that uh, those three teams uh, have managed to, uh, to show that this perception was wrong, because you did an amazing uh, work, a phenomenal work, uh, in really short time and in a moment of crisis. So you, you, you've been, you proved that uh, we can generate public goods through research in moment of crisis, almost real time. So my first question for you all uh, is basically, how does it feel uh, to do something so big and so important and in so real time? And when, uh, if you could tell perhaps the moment uh, where you felt that um, really, uh, that, that your work and your projects were extremely important uh, for the whole world. When, when, when did you realize that? So I would like to uh, start with Jacqueline. Please, Dr. Jacqueline. Uh Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the meeting, Shana and Leah and Sia uh, too. Uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Miguel. Uh, I think I don't know yet if I <laughs> did a really huge work. I don't feel like that because it's something that we do normally with the other viruses. So we just uh, try to adapt it to sequence the SARS-CoV-2. So for us, I think as group, it was not a big thing until it went to the media and people started to talk about it and try to understand what we were doing. So, yeah, I think it was a really good thing for the public health in Brazil. And uh, just like we were doing before for the Zebra project, I don't know if you know, but um, the CAD project that I represent today is led by Dr. Esther in Brazil and Nuno Faria here in the UK, especially here in Oxford. And it's just like an extension, uh, optimized extension for the Zebra project that we developed since 2016. And uh, we went through the pandemic of Zika viruses, um, chikungunya, yellow fever, and dengue virus. So this is like, we had this platform, um, all together and we have the experience in doing the sequencing and it was just like trying to 
move this to the SARS-CoV-2. So for us, it was a huge work in the wet lab and also doing bioinformatic analysis. But for us, before the media spot this in the huge thing, we didn't know that it was really a, a huge thing. So for me, it's just I don't feel like we are a super scientist, as I told you before. Uh, I really think that we were doing what we should do in the right time, in the right place, and that came a uh, um, really good response. So I think it's that. Thank you so much. And, and sorry, Andrew. <clears throat> Well, I, I think we probably would reflect a very similar theme from uh, from the uh, the team that worked on developing the vaccine in that, that everyone was really doing what their normal day job is. I mean, it was a bit busier than usual. Um, <laughs> but, but I think for most people, whether they're in the laboratory or in the clinical side, they, they were doing their normal job. Mm -hmm. And so when you say what was, you know, what was extraordinary about it, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's actually fairly mundane. It was quite nice to go to work without all the other cars on the road and um, during lockdowns and so on. But I think it, in many ways, it's fairly, uh, fairly ordinary. And then when, in terms of when was the moment uh, when you realized how important it was, I think that's a difficult one because um, there were so many moments where there were uh, major events finding the first results. Uh, the, the licensure of first here in the UK at the end of December last year, and then the first doses being given. So all of those were, were quite important moments. But to, to specifically answer the question about making a difference globally. That was when COVAX started distributing, which was the 24th of February of this year, when we saw the first doses of the vaccine that we'd all been involved in developing on aeroplanes starting to be shipped all around the world. And I mean, it, it, in many ways, when you say the words, and you were, you're about a billion out, because we're actually at 2 billion today, 2 billion doses today. Um, that, that moment when you say the words sounds incredible. But actually, when you're part of it, it you know, it's very hard to, to feel that that's something which um, is directly a connection to us. It is a connection that requires uh, people in 20 manufacturing sites all, all over the world. The incredible logistics of getting those 20 billion doses to villages in Africa and to remote mountain areas in, in uh, the Himalayas. I mean, that, that's the astonishing thing. And then all of those armies of people in immunization clinics giving it. So, I mean, it, two billion is a lot, um, but our, our bit is in, in the development is a big effort, but it, it, it's part of the day job. And I, I think one thing that's, for me, particularly in this meeting, uh, particularly poignant, um, is the connection to Brazil. Okay. Because half of the development of the vaccine, and of course the UK gets all the credit, which mm -hmm. we're all very pleased about, <laughs> um, but half of the development of the vaccine clinically happened in Brazil with uh, six fantastic trial sites. And uh, you know, I, I feel particularly proud to be here because that was only funded because of the Lemon Foundation who funded the trials, got them off the ground in Brazil uh, when there wasn't any alternative. We, we almost certainly wouldn't have the vaccine without Brazil and the Lemon Foundation's contribution. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So, uh, Beatrice, a little bit. So, Jacqueline and Andrew were already uh, already saying that, well, what their teams were already doing and that that led them uh, to make it much more easy to, to give this rapid response in a moment of crisis. What about yourself and your team? Well, for me, certainly I think the difference is that wasn't part of my original day job. I'm a lawyer by training uh, and tracking COVID uh, government responses across the world was something that I started doing uh, on top of my day job. And it certainly didn't start big. It started really small with a couple of four researchers from here, from the school uh, and a few MPP students coding policies on spreadsheet forms and then copying and pasting and started really, really small and gained scale and scope really, really quick. I think that, uh, I think part of the challenge was having people who are working in different projects, but all thinking about public policies and working for the public good and to, work, to improve government policies, but working in different areas, coming together to tackle this new challenge. So I think one difference is that we are not doing that as part of the day job. It, became, it was something that we created to address this new pressing complex problem that emerged uh, and hit us uh, quite uh, suddenly. And I think that, again, when we first started as this uh, small group of researchers and some MPP students, 
COVID was still gaining traction. So there were the, the cases in Italy were growing. We have been seeing uh, the cases in China, but it certainly wasn't a global uh, problem at the time. And as it, COVID grew and uh, hit many more countries, so did the project. So I think it's a project that in a way follows uh, the trend of the pandemic. So it also grew uh, in terms of uh, scope and number of people. So we have now uh, almost 20 people hired uh, by, by the COVID tracker team. So we have some of them here today. Uh, you also have hundreds and hundreds of uh, volunteers, coders all over the world. And the Brazil team is certainly something I'm really, really proud of. We have a wonderful team of uh, Brazilian coders. Again, some of them are here online joining us for the discussion. And that couldn't have happened uh, without this really global effort of really so many people from all over the world. So thank you for the team here, for the team uh, online, and for especially for the coders who really are the uh, bloodline of, of, of the tracker. So it, it did become very big uh, as the pandemic grew. And I think the moment it hit me that, wow, we are doing something that really has an impact in Brazil and in the world, was when I, I received a message from my high school teacher, a WhatsApp message saying, I just saw you in Jornal Nacional. What are you doing in Oxford? It's like, wow. So that is big. Uh, and I think since then, uh, we also had a lot, lot of impact uh, in other parts of public policy. We're really producing a global good that is helping governments, not only in Brazil, to tackle uh, the pandemic and learn from, from one another. So yeah, yeah really proud of the project. Yeah, Jean Nacional, for those who are not Brazilian and are unfamiliar with, it's basically a daily news show that has, I don't know, like an audience of 50 million people. So it's very impressive to be at Jean Nacional. And Bia, just uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the, the specificity of Brazil and, and the subnational data? So you, mm -hmm. you, you went looking for the subnational data. And, and why uh, was Brazil the first country that you looked at this specific, I mean, uh, had, had this local and regional um, uh, perspective. No, that, that's an excellent point because when we first designed the project and database and the, and the code book for the collection of the data, we were looking at countries as a whole uh, and trying to identify what the governments, the countries, like jurisdictions were doing to address COVID. But with time, we realized that some countries, there was a lot of uh, difference within the country in terms of what was the response level. And Brazil, uh, as we all here know, is a huge country, very diverse, very heterogeneous, and there's a lot of different things happening. Uh, so it wouldn't really make sense for us to track one unit in terms of Brazil as a whole, because Brazil had many different reactions, many different responses within Brazil, both at the state level and at the municipal level. And again, uh, I think that we had different reasons why choosing Brazil, I think they, in scientific terms, these are the strongest rationale, but for me personally, I was really excited to be coding my home country and to actually be looking with a, with a, um, amplifying lenses at what was happening on the ground and trying to give back uh, to Brazil in a way while we're all here in lockdown. So that was my personal take on it as well. Thank you. And, and I know that you're all saying that, well, this is a, your regular job, uh, but, uh, but, but I find this quite surprising that in, a, in an university, um, you have uh, this capacity of uh, doing um, uh, almost real-time uh, research and at the same time impact uh, the lives of millions of people. So uh, what are the, the, I mean, the, the material conditions and, and the institutional um, uh, or cultural environment, perhaps, of, of Oxford University that has enabled uh, this kind of research and this kind of organization for you to tell me, no, this was absolutely regular uh, work. So Jacqueline, could you uh, 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 respond to that, please? Um, well, the CAD project, it has two branches. One is Brazilian, and the other one is in the UK, especially here in, in the Oxford, but we also have uh, collaborators in Birmingham and Edinburgh. And we have this capillarity with so many people working together. So, well, when I was really in the lab with my group doing the sequencing, we had all people here in the UK branch, especially here in Oxford with Dallin and Nono and Lucy and everyone here uh, working on the bioinformatic analysis and also for the report. So 
uh, people say the 48 hours was really fast, but for us, it's just like a joke because we did this in the in last time. But the 48 hours was uh, our time to do the sequencing and also to analyze everything and write the reports. So the infrastructure from here in Oxford was especially doing the bioinformatic analysis and also trying to understand and put our sequence uh, together with the others that were already uh, available in the database. So uh, if I didn't have uh, the support of the Oxford team, especially with Nunu, Darlan, Lucy, and everyone who was here in Oxford, and also Dr. Andrew Rumble in the Edinburgh uh, University, and also uh, Dr. Nicola Loma uh, in the Birmingham. We couldn't do this in the 48 hours and spread the word that we had the sequence and that was a complete genome sequence and also that we, we had already uh, placed it in the, um, I could say the word context. So I think that uh, we have this structure in Brazil that we do a lot of lab work, but we also, uh, need as essential work the the branch we have here in Oxford, especially for understand what the genome says and what we can learn from that. So it is really <laughs> a huge team that work together and we work it in the 48 hours. I think maybe sleeping two or three hours between <laughs> this time. So yeah, but it was a, a group a group work, a teamwork, and it, and it was really good. Fantastic. Uh, Andrew, please. Uh, well, I, I think uh, Oxford is the most extraordinary place scientifically. And uh, in vaccines, there are about, uh, normally about 400 people working on vaccines. Uh, we all work in our silos with our own projects, mm -hmm. developing and testing vaccines. And so the science is there from the, the first bit of design of a vaccine through testing in animals and then human testing is, is there um, in, in an enormous amount, which allows you that end-to-end -end bit. Um, and then there's some of us like myself who have also worked on uh, the enormous scale of trials. The last trial I did just before the pandemic was 100,000 children of a typhoid vaccine. And, and the type of um, sort of infrastructure you need to do that in terms of the other people and their knowledge in, within the team mm -hmm. was here. And because we you know that as I say, the day job is that we make vaccines and test them. <laughs> and so all of that is that the difference in a pandemic is that you need scale and capacity much, much bigger than we had had in the past. And I think the huge success was that we could bring those different teams working on all the different diseases together and say, well, let's just do COVID for a bit. And that meant that we had the scale of uh, Pedro Folagatti is here in the audience. He was one of those people um, uh, working um, in the Jenner Institute and uh, you know, was part of the enormous group of, 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 of individuals who was, was there here in Oxford. So I think the first thing is just the science was here and we had the, the internal capacity. Um, the second thing I think which is critical and um, I, I think the, the university often underappreciates it, but the infrastructure to be able to do stuff is extremely good here. Mm -hmm. um, and whether that's the research agreements um, to allow collaboration with other institutions which can be done and um, were done often um, in a matter of hours, um, or it's the uh, the uh, ability to uh, to work with governments to to try to facilitate um, processes to move things on. Um, so all of, all of those structural things internally, I mean, the university were important. And I think thirdly is collaboration. That there's that we have a huge um, network of global collaboration, um, and you know, people who are, who are not only scientific collaborators but friends who you can reach out to. So our South, South African. Um, Chief investigator, someone I know very well. I mean, in Brazil, we were lucky to have Sue Ann Clemens lead, who you know I've known for more than twenty years. Mm -hmm. So there, there are people um, in the uh, the system um, already um, who we can reach out to and collaborate with, and that's critical. Fantastic, thank you. So it's you really need to have rapid response. You need to have a, an infrastructure that is yeah, you, running you, on a regular basis of course well, you have to have something going on regularly yeah. to be ready for the next pandemic you can't wait uh, and do nothing you have to keep on going and have routine stuff happening and research being driven so that you can drop everything and focus on on whatever it is next time absolutely 
Hopefully not in my lifetime. I <laughs> hope. <laughs> Neither in mine. Uh, but at least. <laughs> No, I think this is a really good question. I think there are two levels where being here made uh, made it possible for the tracker to be born. I think, firstly, uh, being at a school, a school that supports and recognized uh, the creation of a public good that has public impact has been uh, really uh, a condition without we wouldn't be able to do it. In academia, and especially in social science, I think, uh, the recognition that comes uh, with the work is the number of papers published or the numbers of citations you receive. Whereas here at the school, it really values being doing something that has an impact in the real world that really uh, policymakers can use. It can be a useful tool to actually change uh, or really improve uh, the uh, way governments have been, have been responding to the pandemic. So here, being at school and receiving the institutional support to do so has been uh, really valuable. And I think wouldn't, Tracker wouldn't have been born in many other institutions, I would say. Uh, and secondly, being not so, I think the branding really helps. I think we, the award that we receive, that we give and the advice that we give based on the data receives a lot of attention for being Oxford, being a well, no institution and uh, we do we have a weight in terms of what we say because of Oxford but I think it was Spider-Man who said that with great power comes great responsibility because at the <laughs> same time when you say something and and we know that we're going to be heard as Oxford University uh, it puts us a lot of responsibility on our shoulders should be giving robust advice so that uh, is also on us to produce uh, data and to produce evidence that is really robust and, and, and based on the data we've gathered. Fantastic. And uh, what, what do you think that, uh, what are the lessons that we, of course, we're already discussing the heaven infrastructure in order to uh, make sure that you can respond to um, a major crisis as we, we had or still having the major crisis. But what are the lessons that you can, uh, for, for, for the way that research is structured um, uh, and the way that you conduct your projects, so that what are the lessons apart from COVID that you have uh, that we could draw out of this experience of the experience of your uh, three teams? So, Jacqueline. Well, I think the the most thing we learned from the pandemic and also for the future pandemics we we're, we're gonna face in a while is the preparedness. I think that. Um, I don't know if I, if you know the, the story behind this 48 hours, but it was just like uh, when we heard about the pandemic, also the COVID case in, uh, in China, and also in January, we, we saw the, the cases going going up in the Europe. Um, the doctor is there, and I say she's kind of a witch, a science witch, because she has gone uh, through uh, too many um, epidemic cases and phase that she knows everything about viruses emerging in the world. And she said, uh, we will have the pandemic here in, the, in Brazil. And I said, oh, no, I don't think so. And she said, yeah, just wait for, for a moment and we'll have it. So we need to get prepared. And that's what we did. Uh, I remember coming back from uh, holidays at the end of the year uh, from Salvador, which is my um, hometown. And I was on the beach and everything. And she was texting me, when you come back? And I say, OK, I am planning to go in a week, maybe two. And she said, I need you now because <laughs> we need to prepare the lab. We need to prepare the, the, the team. Um, because I really think that the COVID will get to Brazil soon. And we hope it's after the carnival, but uh, actually it was in the middle of the carnival. Yeah. So from January to the end of February, we were really working hard to get everything settled to um, the, pos the possible uh, arrival of the virus, the introduction of the virus in Brazil. And that happened exactly like she said. So I think that when we are prepared, and now we have lots of um, approach that we can use to um, discover new viruses, not only viruses, any um, uh, microorgan microorganism, but I think that mostly for viruses, we, we have lots of approach that we can use to do this um, surveillance of the new epidemic. 
Um, and that's what we did. So we prepared everything to receive the fire. So every time we, we had a call with the uh, reference laboratory, they were, oh, we have a suspected case, but it's, uh, let's wait for the confirmed or not. So I think we had at least five false alarm uh, before the real COVID-19 case. And we were prepared, so we could go to the lab, we could sequence, we could analyze the genome and see uh, what we could do for public health. Unfortunately, um, we all know that Brazil was not the best example of handling the pandemic, and especially with politics and everything. But um, I think that we did a great work in Sao Paulo uh, because we were based there. And our group uh, did a lot of work, and we have in four months uh, almost 500 uh, genome sequenced. And it was a team of maybe six because we were in the, the lockdown, and we only had six people that lived together, uh, not together, but near the laboratory. So that was the, plus, the people that were really going to the lab. And I remember that I worked for, I don't know, maybe 18 hours every day. So I just went home, took a nap, uh, get a shower and go back to the lab. So our meals and everything we did in the lab, that was uh, how we could generate this amount of uh, genome sequence. And uh, we did this in five, I could say four months. Yes, this is the huge paper we had by July. Uh, Dahlan is the first author, and he worked on the, all the analysis. And we could say, oh, the pandemic in Brazil has um, two phases. The pandemic in Brazil was affected by the non-pharmaceutical interventions we had. So we, we could really respond uh, some questions about public health in Brazil. And I think that this could be done in a huge uh, dimension if we had a unified uh, approach, especially coming from the Minister of Health and everything. So what we did in Sao Paulo was really uh, something that I think that should be done all in, all in all states in Brazil. So yeah, I think preparedness, now we, we've learned that, and I, I really think that maybe in the next pandemic we'll be more um, aware of how to handle it. So I think this is the... So we're having a next pandemic? Yes, for yes. sure. When? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about that. <laughs> I, I really hope that it takes long because we need to, we need to rest now and, and we, we need to get down with this high energy of uh, trying to find the pandemic, but yes, we'll have it. It's a fact. Yeah. So, Andrew. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we probably all have learned something about ourselves in the pandemic, but whatever we were doing, and um, I think certainly those who've been working in vaccine development had to find some uh, some resilience um, to keep going over the last two years. Um, but I, but if you look at the structural issues of, of you know what um, could be done differently. One of the difficulties is that a lot of those things which have gone extremely well in a pandemic where you're focusing on one disease, is very difficult to translate into the real world. So the regulatory processes and so on, they could drop everything and focus just on the vaccine. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, after the pandemic, they have to deal with diabetes drugs and things that are of no interest to me at all. Um, but And so that does mean it will take longer to, to do things in between pandemics in, in vaccine development. Um, but those systems, at least here, work relatively efficiently. And um, in Brazil, um, Anvisa, I think, has done a remarkable job in, in supporting clinical development in, in Brazil and has really adopted many of those rapid processes that are, uh, were used here in the UK, which had made Brazil one of the best places to do research, actually, interestingly, during the, um, the pandemic. Um, but you know, a lot of those things, as I said, I don't think can continue. It'd be good if some... Uh, elements of bureaucracy around doing research were simplified in the way that they have been and stayed that way, mm -hmm. um, obviously without cutting any corners around safety. Uh, but the thing that would make the biggest difference would actually be funding. And um, the, 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 one of the biggest problems, you, you know about 
phase one and phase two and phase three trials, which is fantastic because beforehand no one knew what those meant. <laughs> uh, but, but in the past, if you could get the money to do the phase one trial, you, you get the results of that trial, then it takes another one or two years to get the money for the next phase of the trial. Um, then to manufacture some more vaccine, you have to wait for a manufacturing slot. That might be 18 months. <laughs> and so normally it's actually money um, and, uh, and some capacity of manufacturing that makes things take the most enormous amount of time. It, it isn't actually doing the, the research that's the, the time consuming bit. Thank, Thank you. <clears throat> I think drawing on some of the themes that have been discussed already, there are two main things that I think uh, are good learnings that we could uh, take forward. And I, I think the Lemon Foundation program uh, is the right, also on the right place to take forward. What is uh, partnerships and collaboration. So what really worked for us was working with partners, again, from all over the world. We have a really good and strong partnership with FGV Rio. We have some partners joining here today. We published uh, a lot of papers with them. We collected and analyzed a lot of data. So having strong partners in academia like FGV Rio, but also in government and other institutions to, to work with uh, has been a really good aspect of the tracker project and something that we hope to take forward uh, within the Lemon Foundation program as well. And again, the second point, which connects uh, to what uh, Sir Andrew was saying just now, is uh, flexibility to, and cap cap capacity to uh, turn to different problems. So one aspect of it is funding, so having flexible parts of funding to be able to shift from one problem to the other, but also having time and uh, institutional uh, support to actually drop everything you have, you have been doing to focus on something that is really pressing and really important. And here at the school, I think we had that. We had support from the school to actually work in this new innovative project that was a tracker and having funding behind it, which first took a little bit to come in, like four months, uh, but it did. So having this uh, flexible support and being able to change the focus uh, really quickly to fo focus on the problems that are emerging, I think uh, is something that we also uh, should take forward as a lesson. So capacity and um, collaboration, I would say. Fantastic. And uh, uh, well, so this question is first to, to, to Sir Andrew. It's about, um, it's about Brazil. So Brazil, you were mentioning about the clinical trials and, and how it was uh, one of the best places to do research during uh, the, um, the pandemic. But um, why Brazil is interesting from a Point of view of, uh, of 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 scientific research. I mean, what 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 drives what, why Brazil um, uh, is so interesting and and so appealing? Um, well, Bra Brazil is interesting, but, but actually everywhere is interesting. We have projects in South Asia and Africa mm -hmm. as well, um, working with with local investigators there. Uh, Brazil, uh, as a country, obviously is hugely diverse, as all, all has already been discussed. Um, but there's also um, quite a good um, health infrastructure, which actually is something which um, can be connected into for, uh, for the type of research that, um, that we do. And, and we were able to, uh, to find excellent investigators very quickly um, across the country. There's quite a rich history of, of uh, development of uh, vaccines and already uh, across the country. So, uh, you know, I think it's, it, th there are some advantages in our area around infectious diseases some interesting infectious diseases of Brazil, as you were talking about before, um, as well as um, having some very good research infrastructure, which is quite different from, from um, some other countries. But actually, to be honest, Latin America you know, in general has, um, has uh, great capacity. In other areas, in, in what we call non-communicable diseases, so um, uh, you know, things like cardiovascular disease and diabetes and so on, Brazil also has a huge burden yes. um, that is quite different from um, some other countries. And that um, also means that there are some important questions for the population to address and um, where um, universities um, can collaborate and look into that. So I think, you know, there's the specific features of populations which make it important to study things for that population, but actually it is um, helpful around the world too. Thank you. Thank you. And Beatrice, um, uh, what, what do you think about the, the, all the data that we have uh, at, at our health system? and? And uh, do you think it's different from other countries? How, how would you analyze from a research perspective and, um, well, Brazil as a laboratory for, for social research? It's a wonderful laboratory. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah there's so much data, so much to learn from Brazil. Uh, I think one, one difficulty that we sometimes had is that the data is not always readily available or easy to access, but there is data. 
and data has been historically collected. We have been through a few hiccups recently in terms of the data that has been collected. Uh, but historically, thinking about uh, the, the size of the country and the wealth of data we produce is a really interesting uh, country to, to research for sure. So I think the Lemon Foundation program is not going to uh, be, uh, be running out of data to, to analyze in the next <laughs> few years. That's for sure. And Dr. Jacqueline, um, you mentioned already a little bit about the, the Zika virus research you, you were doing before, uh, but uh, could you tell us a little bit more how did this uh, influence or inform your work uh, during the, the for, for the COVID? Um, I, I would say that I was graduated in apoviruses uh, before the SARS-CoV-2 because I worked uh, between 2016 and 2020. Mm -hmm. So uh, we began working on Zika viruses. Uh, we had this project which was Zebra, uh, which is uh, just like the acronym for uh, Zika virus in Brazil real-time analysis. So this was the first project we ran in Brazil to try to sequence uh, in real time. So we deployed the, the technique we use now uh, with the sequence uh, from the Oxford Nanopore technology, which is a mobile sequence that we can carry to many places and do the sequence in field. And that's what we did. Uh, uh, we, for the Zika virus and also for the other upper viruses uh, during this period. Um, so in the first in the first phase, we we went through um, I could say a bus, but it was set up for a mobile laboratory, and we went through the northeast in Brazil. So we we went to five cities, uh, collecting and working on the samples in the field, and then we worked in the samples uh, between. Uh, uh, back in the lab. So this was when I learned how to use this technique. And then uh, through the years, I was uh, being trained and, and also being experienced in using the, the technique. I also came to the UK in 2017. So I spent six months here in the Birmingham University when I had the opportunity to really being training <laughs> using the, the sequence because I did this every day for the six months. And when I get when I got back to Brazil, we were just trying to build this capacity for the others that were not working yet. So we have, uh, I think, three or four people that were tra training in 2016. And then we, we spread this knowledge and train all others that are now in Brazil uh, doing the sequencing. So I think that this project was really the base for the others, and that now that we use for SARS-CoV-2, we can use for other viruses, especially if we are looking for uh, new viruses, because we now have lots of protocols optimized to, to look for uh, viruses that we don't know yet, but that probably are being are uh, transmitted uh, critically here. <laughs> so. Thank you, Dr. Jacqueline. Uh, my, my, I think my, my last question will be uh, concerning, well, I mean, the future. So we, we've been for almost two years under this pandemic. And um, so what, what, are you, what are your plans? Uh, what are the plans of the, your teams? Um, what are the, the, um, the research questions that you're you are ad trying to address uh, for, for, for next year. So please come, Beatriz. Um, I think as we, we heard uh, at the beginning of the day today, uh, building back from COVID is one of the key areas that the Lemon Foundation program is going to be working on. So we're really excited to uh, be using the data, analyze the data that we gathered throughout the pandemic to actually improve public policy in Brazil to really uh, make sure that we are not only back to where we started before the pandemic, but actually building better uh, in many various areas, including education, which is one of our uh, key focus, but also things like income support and what happened uh, with Alcino Emergencial and what is going to lead afterwards. Uh, so uh, using the huge amount of data that we collected, not only through the COVID tracker, but also through the surveys that we run in Brazil, analyzing it and using the findings to build back better uh, is the key point of the agenda that we, one of the key points of the agenda that we're going to have in the next few years. Great, thank you. 
So, Andrew? Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I think the first thing at the, the high level is that um, we, we need to um, get back to some of the projects which were put on hold mm -hmm. uh, because of the pandemic. We, you know, we work on vaccines to improve child health in my group, and uh, we, we can't um, leave children behind because of the pandemic, which hasn't affected them directly um, as much. Um, secondly, we, is that we are um, very actively working on strengthening some of our partnerships, including with Brazil, um, through um, our programs. So I think that that's going to be an important bit of the, the plans for the um, the future. Um, very specifically on, on individual projects, um, we, we have um, a series across the teams in vaccines on outbreak um, diseases, so things that could be future pandemics, but actually in countries today, they are causing outbreaks, they just haven't turned into ones that spread throughout the whole world. So that's one really important area to, yeah. to be focused on. And the, one of the other reasons why that's so important is that those are often the families of viruses that then can cause pandemics later. So it's one of the reasons why we were so well prepared this time. We were working on coronaviruses already because they had the potential. And uh, secondly, uh, in, uh, in my um, group is looking very specifically at various childhood infections. We're particularly interested in uh, 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 bacteria and viruses that cause pneumonia, um, as well as those that cause diarrhea in children. We have major programs in those areas. Fantastic. And Dr. Jacqueline? Well, uh, I think we are joining the same page. Mm -hmm. See, Andrew just said, uh, we we are using to work on our providers saying this was stopped because of the pandemic. It was interrupted because of the pandemic. And now we are trying to get back, but um, something that people just said here, we need to find. And uh, I think that I think the card has now uh, an expired date, especially because uh, we we got some funds from Brazil, which is uh, surprising that uh, we we extended the project in Brazil from Fapaspi and uh, because of the achievements and everything. But we have uh, some cuts in the UK side, so now we are trying to understand how we can uh, keep going with this next year especially because we need to get back to the to the uh, providers we are now facing some uh epidemics of dengue in brazil which he, uh, of course it was not uh, uh stopped but what it was hidden i think from the sars cov 2 and now we are having more cases and everything so we need to get back and, and try to understand what is happening now but we have these um, opposite side because we we were not expecting Brazil to to give us funding and now we have funding from Brazil but we don't have funding from the UK side so now I think that we are trying to figure out how to do this and get back to the hypervirus because they are endemic in Brazil so uh, we all we have that all the time so we really need to get back. Thank you, thank you. So uh, let's move to the audience. I, I think we can, if you if you want to uh, ask something for our panelists, please raise your hand. For those who are um, online, uh, you can you can write in the chat, and then we can read it. Yes. Good uh, afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, Jacqueline, I have my questions for you. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to hear from you, a very inspiring scientist. Um, we are part of a research project that is analyzing gender norms and vector control policies in Brazil. And we run some interviews this year with uh, community health workers and question them about arboviruses during the pandemic. And most of them answered us that they just didn't notice anything, like nobody talked about it. So I would like to, to, uh, to question you about it. So how, is, how did you assess this, uh, the state of arboviruses, the situation of arboviruses now in Brazil during the pandemic, including because you are part of a team that used it to, uh, to research arboviruses and you needed to stop to, to research COVID also. Well, um... What I see from these few years, these past two years, that most of the centers that were referenced for the arboviruses just uh, had to change to um, attend for the COVID-19 pandemic. And we, we really probably have 
this gap of these two years with no data or I, I would say no, but really uh, uh, few data about arboviruses because uh, all the centers, including the centers we were working, uh, they stopped to receive um, arboviruses cases because they were all dedicated to the SARS-CoV-2. So I really think that it's a, it's a tough time now because we are trying to get this back, but probably we don't have, we won't have the data for this period, which is really bad <laughs> for us, especially for us who, who do um, surveillance, because we need this data to understand what's happening in Brazil. So I think it's gonna be, a real, actually it's been hard to get back because we are trying to understand which centers we can work and we probably won't have data from from this period. So it's really it's really difficult. But I think this highlight uh, probably uh, some point that we need to work more and strengthen when we, we say when we talk about uh, public health in Brazil because we we couldn't have this uh, uh, stop this break in the other not only arboviruses I think the, in the other diseases. Uh, especially neglected disease. So it's something that public health needs to strengthen for the next epidemics and next pandemic. But it's a shame, yes. Perfect, so Gabriela. So first of all, thank you for everything you have done for us in the last year. Uh, it's amazing to be here listening to you, to all the changes you have been facing to take care of all of us. I have a question for you, for all of you, whoever wants to answer it. Uh, I, I think that this process of facing the pandemic exposed a, a really huge politiz politicization of the science, or at least politics trying to interfere in the process of producing science. And I can say this from my country, I'm Brazilian, and we are facing everyday problems with our president. I would like to hear from you, uh, if and how the politics interfered the process of doing science for you, and how did you deal with it? Who wants to start, Sir Andrew? Yeah. Um, I, I think the answer um, to that is uh, that certainly if, if you live in the UK, it's fairly clear that um, there's definitely been um, uh, politics involved in um, a lot of what's happened since the vaccines were approved um, in the various political statements have been made, whether it's um, in the UK sort of championing a British vaccine, which is a political statement, um, or it's uh, Europeans um, uh, or the European Commission making negative comments about um, uh, you know, contracts and so on. But those are political statements. Um, so there's definitely politicization. But from a scientific perspective in, in the vaccine development, I'm not so sure that that has a big influence on what you do day to day. There's some of some of those statements mean that you need to reassure trial volunteers and staff, but it doesn't necessarily feed through into the, the process of developing um, vaccines. Um, and I'm, I'm certainly not personally aware of any political interference, for example, in, with, with regulators in Europe or anything like that, although, of course, it, it may have happened. And similarly, my interactions with the regulator in Brazil seem very straightforward scientific interactions. So I, I think it's an interesting point. There's clearly been lots of politicization of vaccines, but whether that really impacted the science is an interesting um, question. There is another element to this, which is that science and politics, people reckon should stay separated, but actually they need to be close together because we need our politicians to understand the science and to actually develop evidence-based policy as much as possible. And the, the difficulty, um, that I think a lot of scientists you know, want uh, everything to be based on evidence. The truth is the policy always has to be a bit of a leap from the evidence because you don't have evidence for everything that you have to make policy on. And so sometimes politicians get unfairly criticized of having to make a decision um, about what their policy should be in, in the, the face of not enough evidence and ne never more so than in a pandemic where it's really difficult to make decisions. But I do think we've got to get science closer to politicians um, than, than it has been. Yeah, do you want to add something? Yeah, I agree with everything that Sir Andrew said. And I would say that one of the courses that we teach here at MPP is the politics of policy making. So when we are tracking COVID policies all around the world, we are also uh, tracking in a way 
the politics behind the policies that we are we are collecting data about. Uh, so it's uh, necessarily going to be uh, infused by the politics of the region, the jurisdiction that is adopting, implementing the pol policy. So the politics helps you understand a bit of why the policy was adopted. We also have worked really closely with politicians in some context to provide advice and to try to understand the data that we are providing because we wanted the tracker to be a, a, a public good, we wanted it to really have a real world impact. We have really uh, tried to reach out to politicians and, and to convene uh, our messages. So it is being a really interesting experience, uh, but what we have tried to, be, to do is uh, to provide the evidence and to provide robust evidence. So not I, I agree with Sir Andrew that I don't think that necessarily the politics influenced our process, but we try to influence the policy in a way through politicians. Dr. Jacqueline, do you want to add something? I would say from my, from my perspective, especially in Brazil, that uh, the heterogeneous thoughts, especially coming from uh, uh, the Apple, uh, politicians uh, uh, could be better. I think that maybe uh, it's, it's it's kind of difficult from our side because we we have a best to say what we say when we go to the media or when we are asked or uh, say something about what is happening during the pandemic. So sometimes it gets to the to the side of the hate and and the, and everything. So. I got this. I was one of the, the, the target for uh, for this kind of uh, aggressive uh, behavior. But um, I really think that we 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 try to keep on the safe side in Brazil and try to uh, stand for the science and say uh, we we really know that this is the evidence we have. So we won't uh, step back because you are trying to. Um, maybe uh, split the, the the country in two sides. So, yeah, I think for the for the measures it was really bad. But for the science, uh, I feel like we are we are strong to say what we really think because we we really step and say no. I I really think that is not that way, and we keep this opinion because we have a best. So. Uh, adding to what everyone has already said. Thank you. I think João has a question. I have a question from online, from Maria Fernanda Quartiero from Institu Instituto Cactus. She asks, uh, is there any way that the data that was gathered in this research could contribute to the mental health crisis that many cr countries will be facing in the aftermath of the pandemic? Fantastic. Bia, do you want to take this one? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> happy to. Uh, indeed, I think part of the team that has been working on the tracker was invited to be part of the Lancet Lental Health Commission uh, that has be, that has gathered uh, uh, not only social scientists, but also medical scientists and uh, scientists from different institutions to try to understand uh, the impact that COVID had on mental health. And Anna was part of the commission and produced really uh, important results in terms of what type of uh, policies uh, and what the duration of policies that really impact mental health. And I think one of the, this report should be published soon and be available so everyone can see uh, how the data has been used uh, for that end. And I think Anna will be happy to provide you with some sneaky peek into the data and findings. But I think one of the things that I remember hearing her mentioning is that a vaccine and vaccination rollout actually improves mental health. So that's also a finding useful for politicians. Thank you. Do you want to add something to that? I was going to make the same comment that vaccines are the best thing for mental health. For yes. <laughs> yeah, I can do them. yes. <laughs> Any other questions from the room? And from online? There is another question for, for Beatriz from Eduardo Araujo. He asked if there were any findings from, uh, findings from the tracker regarding economic policy of subnational governments, and if there were any indicators that showed evidence uh, about the impact of those measures in reducing poverty. 
That's an excellent question. Yes, we have we have been working on a policy brief that's about to be published soon, which uh, identifies the impact that income support policies had uh, in Brazil. We we don't disaggregate necessarily in terms of the subnational uh, policies individually, but we show that auxílio emergencial, which was the main income support rolled out in Brazil uh, over time, had a really, really important impact in terms of supporting the livelihoods of, of people during the pandemic, and that uh, the, the way the policy was targeted was actually helping the ones most in need. So I think this is a very strong finding that uh, targeting the lower uh, income uh, income uh, uh, brackets and also having a, a support that was extensive and uh, lasted for a, a considerable amount of time was really important. So that's a, a robust finding and we have a paper coming out soon that discusses this. Any other question? Oh, yes, please. Um, my name is Kai Machado. I'd like to do a follow-up to uh, Gabriela's question on politics and, and science. Um, I agree that the two should go together. And if we have a, a quick glance at Oxford, we can see how science is often also very political and sometimes feudal. Um, so my question would be, uh, is there then space for democracy within science? Because in a series of pandemics, for example, perhaps choosing what to research, what angle, what to prioritize comes from scientific methods and institutions even before reaching the higher uh, ranks of politics. So anyway, if, if I could hear any thoughts on that, I'd be very happy. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're, it's a really good point about uh, who actually drives the agenda. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, it, 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 of course, it is, is the scientists having some autonomy, but um, a large proportion of, of what's decided is depends on who's prepared to fund. And so if, if you look in many countries, it's actually government funding agencies, which are the, the main funders. And so it, it will be government priorities often where the research is, is prioritized. Um, of course, somewhere like the UK, where there's a very large charity sector, there are individual groups. I mean, in, in, in my area in pediatrics, for almost every disease that children have, there's a charity that raises money for research um, in that area. So that um, can be very helpful in coming from the bottom up from from actually from the public uh, of where they think the priorities should be and we see as i say we see that very strongly here with uh, you know with uh, lots of money in in uh, from the british heart foundation or for the various cancer charities and that help drive research in those areas um but the, this question about democratizing it, it is is a problematic one because however much you might decide what you want to work on if no one's going to pay for it it ain't going to happen <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Jacqueline, do you want to add something? No? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so do we have any other questions? We have one from online, but Julia uh, would like to ask live. So oh, wow, of course. Can we go to Julia now? Wow, what an honor to be asking this question <laughs> lively. But um, I'm very curious to hear, based on the experience of the three of you, what are efficient strategies um, for this knowledge that is produced within academia to spread beyond the walls of the university and actually be accessible for public agents, people doing pop, uh, you know, policy on um, the field or to the population in general? Okay, I missed the key bit of what the question was. Yeah, Julia, could you repeat a little bit? There was, it was a bit yeah. distorted, so just missed a yeah. little bit of the, the key bit of the question. I can't, oh, sorry. Can you guys hear me? Because I couldn't unmute my microphone before. Yeah. yeah, now it's better. Okay, so I'm just going to repeat the question. The question is about um, your experience with efficient strategies for the knowledge that is produced in, within academia to be spread to the society, either public agents or the population in general. I, I think it's a really good question because there's been a huge attention on science in the pandemic, which I hope will be a good thing with, uh, with a sort of a legacy of greater public engagement with what's going on in science. But 
uh, th there is a difficulty there in, in that the medium through which we communicate science is, is not the public reading our scientific publications, um, but, the, but journalists interpreting those, uh, perhaps interviewing people, and it's their headlines and their narrative um, that actually is the way the public are informed. Um, and of course, that does mean that uh, you know, if, if you uh, do an interview with, with a journalist, that the, uh, the specific issues um, that will make a headline are the ones which tend to be the ones that they'll prioritize in the story rather than the whole truth. So I, I, I do think that the way uh, um, communication is very difficult um, uh, with the public through the media because you're not in control of that process. Um, so I think we definitely need to think more about how, how best to, to communicate, what, what is the way to translate the science. And, and you know, obviously you can do that through websites and so on, but most people don't read that. Um, so more work still to be done there, I think. I would love also to hear Dr. Giacchellini because you're also a, a big science communicator, so. Yeah, not that big, but <laughs> <laughs> yes, because I, 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 I am in this uh, struggle state, uh, trying to do research and trying to respond to the journalist and media agenda, just like Sir Andrew just said. Uh, we say, uh, Ten things and they pick one and put this on the highlight and sometimes it's not the tone we would like to to have to the uh, audience so I really think that we should and that's something that I always say I think that we as a scientist uh, we, we we from from when I am scientist I've never seen uh, scientists going to the media and trying to to explain things scientific things to the to the public and this is all new for me just like it happened on the pandemic so i really think that we we thought we talked a lot between us as scientists and we always respond for us as scientists and we write papers for other scientists we don't write papers for the for the public and uh, sometimes we struggle trying to say uh, complex things to the audience because we don't know how to do this we don't know to be uh, how to be simple and i i had a, a really uh, busy year trying to do this kind of communication but i am only one of course we have lots of uh, uh, communication uh, scientists uh, that are doing communication in Brazil. I, I should uh, cite here Natalia Pastenac, uh, Gabriel uh, Cabral Miranda, or probably, sorry, uh, Atla. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think it's only few scientists doing this. So we really need uh, a, a kind of, uh, I don't know, maybe a group, a strong group that works together, not only in Brazil, but in the whole world to really address these kind of questions to the public, but in a way that we are not misunderstood, sorry. So yeah, I think we need really need to invest on that, maybe trying to uh, uh, create a group, a strong group with lots of scientists, not only three or four, because it's really hard for us, especially for me as US guys. I, I am really trying to do my research, but I, sometimes I feel, uh, okay, I need to go and, and give an interview because this is important and I really want people to hear the right <laughs> side of the science. So it's it's really difficult and I am all one and I, I think that maybe the others uh, uh, feel the same. We don't have this uh, platform to communicate to the public and we need, we need this urgently. So, yeah. Thank I think. you. Beatriz, I know... 20 seconds. No, I, I just want to say that I agree with everything that was said. That sometimes, uh, as a scientist, in my case, a social scientist, the, uh, the job is not only to communicate, to talk to our peers, but also to the public, to policymakers, to government. So there's a, a work, at least my work, I sometimes have to translate from Portuguese to English, but from English to English for different orders, or from Portuguese to Portuguese. So having this translator role as part of the scientist scientific role as well uh, is important. And I think maybe the pandemic has highlighted the importance of it even further. 
And if you want to know any more about vaccines, the Vaccine mm. Knowledge Project website. Um, yeah. tells you <laughs> Fantastic. Thank well, you. thank you so much uh, for uh, for sharing all the, all the, the the experience that you had, and thank you again for your amazing work and the amazing work of each one of your teams. Thank you. Thank you.